Our next presenter is Dr. Keto Swan, an associate professor of African diaspora at Howard University. We are very thankful to have him with us again for three years in a row. Thank you, Keto. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I love Kids and Culture Camp. Uh, I'm going to speak with us today about Ghana, for grasping Ghana's greatness. I think it's week three. Kids and Culture Camp, 2014. I think mean, Ghana is probably one of the countries that African people in America are probably most familiar with. So I didn't want to bombard you with, you know, too many details about Ghana, but just what I thought might be some key uh, topics that you all could try on some of the activities for the children, which is in essence the point. So if we could move forward. Just click on, oh. right. Yeah, we have right. one of those great things again. Oh, but we, okay. these, these still don't figure out yeah, yeah. these kind of things. Right. Presents. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, it's not as intricate as the last one, but <laughs> this is Ghana. Um, one of the things, this is the shape of Ghana. It's the flag and the shape of Ghana. One of the things that stands out automatically, the colors of Ghana's flag, which we'll get into, and the black star in the middle, which has come from Marcus Garvey's black star line. Um, but let's move, let's move forward. Some basic facts about Ghana, Ghana 101. No, just move forward. Ghana is a country in West Africa, located between Cote d'Ivoire and Togo, which means that a number of ethnic groups in Ghana are actually based in also the, the overlap in Cote d'Ivoire and Togo as well, which are both French speaking um, countries. We can move forward. All right, as we see. Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, Nigeria. Ghana, actually, modern day Ghana is named after ancient Ghana, which wasn't actually right here. Ancient Ghana was more north, uh, west. Kwame Nkrumah renamed it Ghana in, in, in remembrance of Ghana's average ancient um, West African history. We can move forward. The name Ghana means warrior king, and it actually came from the name of the leaders of ancient Ghana, the state was also called Wadugu. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. But I think that's a really fitting, striking term that we could, you could probably utilize in the camp. What does it mean to be a warrior and a king? We can move forward. Ghana has about 25 million people. Compared to Nigeria, it's relatively small in terms of population. It's not an exactly gigantic country, but it has, it's a very diverse space. Uh, you have the coast, you have rivers, the Baltic River, you have forests, uh, rainforests, you have plains. Uh, it's a very, very diverse ecological space. We can move forward. At any given moment, please stop me if you have any, any questions or comments. The primary language spoken is English, although there are many other languages in Ghana, particularly Twi, Enwe, Ga, also Hausa. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, you can get by speaking English, but it's, it's very, I find when I travel to Ghana, it's very important to learn uh, different ethnic languages in Ghana because it makes a difference in trying to connect with African people. That's what Ghana produces petroleum, natural gas, one of the world's largest gold and diamond producers still to this day, and the second largest producer of cocoa in the world. It's also home to the Lake Volta, the largest artificial lake in the world by surface area, which actually most of Ghana's energy comes from the Lake Volta. Um, this also is a space that brings a lot of different ethnic groups together. Like the airway in Ghana primarily live around about the region, so going further east towards Togo. We can move forward to the next slide. History of Ghana. Okay. Just move forward. You just just go forward. Yeah. That's all. If you hit if you hit the right key, it'll always proceed. Okay. All right. <laughs> No problem. Uh, the name Ghana refers to Ugadu, an ancient state, which is located between modern day Mali and Guinea. Some say this is actually the name where the, the term Guinea actually comes from, was uh, Europeans' mispronunciations of Ghana. Ghana traded gold for salt. Uh, it still has that, still has that, um, that distinction of being a major producer of gold. Uh, and once again, it's not, modern day Ghana is not where ancient Ghana was. Ancient Ghana was traded with, with, with Rome, was considered ancient Rome, who was a major part of the state, in addition to states like you know, Mali, and also the Sunlight Empire. Once again, the name Warrior King is referred to his leadership. It was a major trading space 
for not just West Africa, but also going further to North Africa and East Africa as well, across the Sahara Desert. We can move forward, please. European explorers, slave traders, and colonialists refer to modern day Ghana as the Gold Coast. Uh, the Portuguese enslaved numbers of African people from their region because they said they had this magical ability to find gold, to mine for gold, hence the name Mina. Uh, they built the infamous slave dungeon known as Amina Castle, and these Minas ended up all across the Americas. And particularly for the Spanish who were looking for gold and other precious minerals in the Americas, the Minas were very they sought out the Minas because of, like, like I said, they felt they had this, this magical ability to find gold. We can move forward. This is Amina Castle. Uh, if you travel to Ghana, most people go to Amina Castle. It's a place of, of remembrance, a place of mourning. Uh, it also featured in Holly Grimmer's film, Saint Kofa, along with uh, dungeons like Cape Coast, they're probably one of the most, most visible. Ironically though, Amina Castle is right in the center of Amina, and this area is also used for festivals in Amina. And so it's not atypical to find yourself at Amina Castle, expecting to be in a moment of remembrance and mourning, but to not see that displayed in the population immediately following, uh, because right now this area is used for a host of other purposes. You can see the fishing boats as well. And also there's the disconnect between the experience of slavery and the space, uh, even, even within Ghana, which also which often complicates, you know, African people when they return from the, from the Americas or the diaspora to go to the space and it's seen as something happened to the others, but not the folks there. That, that notion is very much there. We can move forward, please. So these are just a few images of, of African people end up in, particularly in the Spanish Americas. Uh, <coughs> this is in Peru, the mine of silver. We can move forward. In Brazil, the Washington Diamonds. A number of these are coming from what's now Ghana. We can move forward. Please. And this is in Colombia. Uh, how do we know sometimes that these are minas? Because even, even today, a number of African people from those populations still have those that last name what the Spanish did as opposed to the British, or the French did as well. A lot of times they named African people or documented African people by the ports that they came from. So you might find somebody in Colombia named Juan Angola, or you might find somebody named, I don't know, Jesus Carabali, uh, to this day, even to this day. But you won't find that as much, let's say, in the United States or in the British Caribbean. You will find European last name. We can move forward. Resistance to slavery. Africans from the Gold Coast, such as the Coromante, developed a reputation not just for the ability to find gold, but also a reputation for resisting slavery, the revolts, and the creation of maroon communities, particularly in the British Caribbean, i.e. Jamaica, Barbados, and Tigua, but the list is actually longer than that. One thing that you found about these maroons, we could proceed forward. Okay. Sorry. When you all want a difference, maybe one of the brothers could do that. Sure? All right. Uh, as we know, maroon communities were free communities formed by state African people who escaped from slavery. Uh, one of the most popular of Gold Coast persons were those in Jamaica, such as Nanny and Cujo. If we move forward, we'll see it. Not an image of Nanny. Nanny is now considered a, a national hero of Jamaica. She was in a con of uh, black jacket bands from Trinidad and Tobago, major pan Africanist thinker of the 20th century, Amy Ashwood Garvey. Malcolm X, Julian Mayfield, Maya Angelou, Richard Wright, Mandela, Franz Fanon, WB, and Shirley Graham Du Bois. Shirley Graham Du Bois was, was Du Bois' wife, but she also was running the television station in Ghana mm -hmm. under, under Nkrumah. Uh, and he, uh, as said, he sought to have it as this place that could further the, the liberation of African people across the continent. So Africans like Mandela were receiving guerrilla training in Ghana. And you see that in the development, or you, you see that very visible in Ghana as a national, as in, in a national sense. We can move forward. For example, Ghana's flag. The flag was directly based upon the United flag, African liberation. Red represented the blood, it was the die in the country struggle, the gold from the mineral wealth, the green, it's forced natural wealth, and the black star symbol of African unity and emancipation 
This came directly from Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line. Uh, Nkrumah also named the Navy of Ghana the Black Star Line as well. And we're going to see that this summer. Hopefully we'll see it by the time we have Ghana Week, World Cup, that Ghana is still, hopefully Ghana is still in the World Cup by the time we have this week. Because you'll see jerseys, you'll see, you'll see this all over the place. I'm looking forward to it. We can move forward, please. And one more, one more. Let's talk about culture a little bit. Uh, Ghana is culturally diverse and a very rich country. Major ethnic groups are the Akan, which are the Ashanti, and the Fanti. The Fanti pretty much surround Amina. The Ewe, the Hausa, and the Ga. The Ewe actually came from the East. Uh, so the, in, in terms of Ghana's history, the relatively late community, but a very important community. Twi is, 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 is a major language spoken in Ghana, and a state that I think it would be very useful to learn some Twi, or have a class to learn some Twi. You can move forward, please. Ghana has numerous cultural festivals and practices that not only remind us of its past, but also help in the function of the society. In other words, while there's a, you know, quote unquote technical government structure that's, there's a legacy of colonialism that's there, also Ghana still operates on the ground with uh, some traditional, traditional leadership as well that's not necessarily connected to the state. So if we move forward, this is an enshrining of the Santeina, a uh, very traditional process uh, by the Akan. We can move forward, please. You have events like Panafest, which take place every two years in recognition of Ghana's independence, African struggles against slavery and colonialism. If you're going to go to Ghana, a good time would, to be, would be to go during Panafest. Uh, it's an amazing, um, an amazing time to be in Ghana. Blacks from all across the world go. It's a, it's a time of celebration, a time of recognition in a very important political space. Ghana's the epitome of how African people use culture to fight against slavery. Although there's this curious like, memory lapse about that experience in colonialism. It's, it's typically very visible for other folks enter the space, but it's not, as, it's not as integrated into the society as it probably should be. You can move forward, please. Uh, OC two through the second, is the 16th Asante, Asanteina of the Kingdom of Asante, which can translate to King. Uh, his regency is based in Kumasi. We can go one more. And so, once again, the Shanti is still controlled. They still have a system of cultural leadership based upon the traditional practices. And the other ethnic groups have their own. Even though Ghana's government is this collaborative space, underneath that, there's still this, this local leadership and cultural practices. And is very important in that space. Okay, cuisine. This is one of my favorite <laughs> sections. All kind of fruits, vegetables, nuts, foodstuffs grow in Ghana. Ghana is amazing. Uh, sweet fruit from pineapples to bananas to mangoes, tiger nuts. And because it has these different ethnic groups, you have these different kinds of foods that also are semi-regional. It's not as regional as once upon a time, but there's still these differences that are really great when you put it all together. So, for example, banku is a very typical food, also eaten by the airway. It's made from fermented corn, cassava dough, much like fufu, uh, cooked in hot water to a smooth white paste. So you can find banku in, in DC, any African grocery store. You want to try it out. Uh, sometimes made with meat or goat or quote unquote bush meat. I ask what that is. They say it's bush meat. <laughs> and they say it's bush meat. And then you probably stop asking. Or, or no meat. <laughs> In that case, you probably say, all right, I just take it just like that. And just, you know. It's, it's, it's delicious to me. We can move forward, please. This is a slight image that's made of some tilapia, but once again, it doesn't always have to be with meat. That could be anything. Uh, red bread is a very simple dish made with black eyed peas, plantains, palm oil, sometimes even with jollof rice. Uh, Ghana is not an entirely rice based society, but you can find rice if you want it. If fufu or banku is not to your, your taste, so you can cake it. You can move forward, please. 
Black eyed peas, onions, tomato sauce, palm oil, the planted. Sometimes it's put on top of something else. But very basic, it's very easy to make, but well, if you know what you're doing. The flavor might be tricky, but the black eyed peas on top of planters. Um, can't get more diasporic than that. The Dinka symbols, obviously this is one of the most popular or most visible aspects of Indian culture. They're typically worn on clothing, they reflect the code of wisdom, spirituality, history, and philosophers of the Ashanti. In Ghana, you will find a Dinka symbol sometimes on walls, just like you see on billboards. Uh, a very, very amazing space and a very interesting way to communicate. Um, I know when, I, when I was first in Ghana, we went to a number of funerals uh, where elders had passed, and it was almost like a celebration. You wouldn't be to know, we wouldn't know it was a funeral unless we, somebody told us, but, or unless we tuned in, because typically we wore specific kind of cloth that had a different symbols that meant that somebody important had died or passed away. So just by the clothing that folks had on, you knew that something had happened in the community. I had one funny case where I, I came back to the U.S. and a few years later, I'm wearing that same outfit, and one of my Ghanaian students came up to me and was like, okay, so who important has died? And I was like, oh man, you're right. I completely <laughs> forgot that I was, I was given a message. Um, I was given the wrong message. I just was wearing it because it happened to match what I had on. <laughs> and it should match, but there's also meaning that comes too with that. So I think, once again, it's another really interesting way to engage uh, the youth on the making of the Dinker symbols or putting the symbols on different fabric or patterns. Particularly, you, you can probably generate more creative, awesome craft ideas than I with that. But the process of making the Dinker from the type of dye, the actual uh, crescent of it, uh, they have all kind of kits or, or ways in which you can, you can do that that I think will be really interesting. And they reflect, you know, different proverbs. The most, the most popular one is probably Sankofa, which means go back and fetch it, which uh, reflects the, the ability of the Sankofa bird to reach his head to the back of his neck, making a cycle. Uh, that also typically means go back home and return, you know, return to the past and move forward. But there are literally a number of these um, that develop over time, and typically they're created based upon artists and some conversation with the Ashanti. So it's not, you just can't make a dinker symbol. Uh, this, this vetting process that it, that they technically have went through um, to become to become official at the market. The market is a wonderful place to experience the cultures of Ghana. Kumasi has the largest market in West Africa, and when I say market, I'm just not referring to the market that visitors or, or travelers or tourists go to. Uh, I mean the spaces where Ghanaians typically buy the goods on a daily basis. Uh, this is a shot from Kumasi. Uh, I I loved it. I loved the smells, the sounds, the busyness, the dirt between your feet. I just loved all of that. The the, the smoke, shrimp, the chai butter. It's it, the market is that amazing space. All the cultures come together. In some spaces, the houses are typically the ones who make entrepreneurs in that space. It's it's. To get it going, go to, to go to the market and you'll you, you'll get it. You'll start to see it. We can move forward, please. Fabric. Ghana is well known for its fabric. Uh, weaving traditions. The Kente cloth is probably the most most popular. But as, as stated, Ghana is so diverse it's not just Kente. That's there. There's all these other, you know, syncretism of different fabric styles and ways to produce fabric. This is a shot from Makola Market. Uh, this is not Kente, but it's another. This is this is this is so typical, so typical. Uh, find the fabric. Sometimes the fabric might have a digger symbols or some other kind of meanings that you can make outfits with or garments with, scarves with. This is a typical loom that Kente is made from. To see Kente weavers in action, it's like watching a miracle unfold. Uh, it's one of the most amazing, amazing things I've witnessed to see how they go from scratch and then all of a sudden there's this elaborate, phenomenal uh, garment that you could wear that has so much deep historical meaning in it. And it's not going to take them quote unquote long to even do it. Yes? Quick question. Sure. I know you probably remember in the late 80s, 90s where there was like a resurgence of kente. You know, everyone right. had the umbrellas and the 
the bags and the, everything was kente. Have you ever heard of any discussion as where the Ghanaians kind of felt that it was not appropriate for some of the types of cloth, the way we were presenting it? <laughs> well, uh, I haven't personally, but there, there is, but those conversations are critical in terms of what's traditional, what's not, uh, what's acceptable. Kente, for example, was typically something worn by royalty. It wasn't simply that it wasn't something that was an everyday um, fabric that everyone wore, but, but Ghana has changed in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so even within Ghana, there, there are these conversations about what's traditional, what's acceptable. Uh, are the youth still practicing or still wearing our clothing, or are they wearing Western clothing, or what what does that mean? Um, but I, I think I think it's a, it's a very important conversation to have. Mm -hmm. I am personally. You know, had those conversations, but the story I even mentioned about myself wearing a, you know, a very significant piece of clothing and not knowing, not remembering the meaning of it, you know, I could have offended somebody. Um, so I think it is important to kind of have an informed, you know, perspective about how we engage in African culture. In this context, it's, it's very easy for us to pick and choose, you know, what we could do, when we could do it, as opposed to in, in certain spaces, certain things have significance and has weight as well. Tie-dye. Uh, I thought tie-dye was European until I went to Ghana. I was like, wait a minute, I've been duped all my life. <laughs> because the only folks I knew who weren't tie-dye were of European descent. And then you get to Ghana and there's major tie-dye factories. So just in a small nutshell, we've seen three very similar but also diverse ways of utilizing fabric. Kente, other cloth patterns, and the tie-dye. You'll find that, you know, uh, in Ghana, and those are some things that you could probably do, you know, with with, with, with children. The making of tie dye, I don't know if that's obviously you make those decisions on yourselves for yourself. But you can't speak of Ghana without speaking of shea butter. Uh, shea butter is primarily produced by black women, but also farmers. Um, me personally, I'd rather get my shea butter in Ghana. I'd rather get as close to the source as possible, but that's difficult. Um, in this kind of context, which I guess speaks to the larger, you know, discussion as well. But this is how I want to see my shape butter when I when I when I find like that. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see it like that. So I have to go buy a container and put it in myself, as opposed to having it done for me. Um, but this is something you'll see in Kumasi, in Kumasi's market. You'll see that. You won't see that at the tourist market. You'll see a little container, a little piece of plastic for you, but if you go further to where other Ghanaians um, will buy the goods, and that's, that's, how you, that's what you will see. Mm -hmm. Music. Ghana is a very musically diverse society. Uh, each ethnic group has their own musical traditions. Now in Ghana you will find, for example, African people that play djembe. But the djembe doesn't come out of Ghana. The djembe is a drum that comes out of Guinea or Ivory Coast or Senegal. It's not, it's not of the Ghanaians. They have their own drum and traditions. Um, I think it's another misnomer sometimes we have. We see, we see a drum and think that's just the drum, but sometimes there are definitely overlaps. But at the same time, there are differences as well. I, I can recall one story where I was in a small village and I heard a djembe. I said, wait a minute, this is strange. Because I was in every land. I said, this is not, I would not hear djembe in every land. If I was in Accra, at the tourist art center, yes, maybe. But in every village, no other drums. You're not, that, that, that loud, distinct djembe sound, you're not going to hear that. So I, I chose to investigate. And I was struck by what I found. Uh, there was a brother from Cameroon, and there was a group of uh, students of different ethnic background that for some reason were teaching the community how to play this drum when the community had their own set of drums, own set of traditions, own knowledge base, but they were being taught by non-African people uh, a drum from another space. It, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. Oh, we can go back. I'm sorry. So, you have the traditional, you also have a major musical form called High Life that comes out of Ghana from the 20th century. It was the music of decolonization. 
Now let's transform the hip life, which is heavily influenced by hip hop. Reggae is also very popular in Ghana. Heavily. Yes. <laughs> if you see some of the videos, beware. Oh, no. Absolutely. <laughs> at, at one point, the Ghanaian government actually had banned our BET <laughs> from being shown in Ghana. That was about maybe 2001. But extremely. I mean, and not, not always in the most yeah, positive <laughs> way. Uh, there was an artist I was familiar with. I, I, I liked them. His name was Reggie Rockstone. But you would have thought he was Buster Rhymes. He was just... And that's, that's interesting. It's always interesting when you see how hip-hop is being utilized, transformed, or, 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 or marketed in, diff in different spaces. Um, as stated, reggae is popular. Zoop has, has transformed in some ways, too. Um, but that's another, I think, interesting way to engage you know, younger people about Ghana is, is through the music. This is the traditional set of airway drums. Uh, let me move forward. These are some Akan drums. Not the same, but they still operate within the same space as well. Spiritual traditions. <clears throat> um, Ghana is, 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 a, is a society heavily steeped in, in spiritual traditions. Its own traditions. Christianity has made a major impact in Ghana, as has Islam. Uh, although you still see spiritual traditions all across society, not as visible, but they're very present. Uh, there's a veneration of ancestors, the Creator and Yame, deeds like the Abusun, and respect for elders is very important across the society, particularly when you leave the, the urban spaces. We most know of the Akan. The Akan is well known for the traditions in the Americas, but the Ewe, we actually, they're also seen as a very spiritual people. It's the Ewe fun culture that produced what we know in America as Vodun. Not Vodun, but Vodun, because they came from the East. Uh, when I went to Ghana, I, I just didn't know that. I just knew of the Akan. So I was in the Ewe village for weeks. I was in a major spiritual center of the Ewe, a village called Dagomete. I had no idea I was in the spiritual site because I was socialized to look at the Akan. You know, it's the Akan. Until weeks I realized, wait a minute, where am I? And this is a major Dika symbol, Ganyame, except for God. Also sometimes translated to God is omnipotent. One of the most popular uh, uh, and different symbols that, that we know of. And sports, as stated, <coughs> exclamation point. <laughs> Ghana's football team, the Black Stars, excuse my use of the word soccer, that was that slipped in, excuse me. Ghana's football team, the Black Stars, i.e. Black Star Line, playing this year's World Cup, <coughs> June 12th to July 13th. Uh, we can move forward. <coughs> this is Ghana's national jersey. And just to sum up, I think some possible activities could be, oh, wait a minute, we didn't see that slide. Uh, there should have been a slide discussing day names, how they, particularly across Ghana, uh, people are, get assigned names by the day they're born on. And an interesting activity could be to have children or have the parents or have you figure out the days that they were born on. Uh, and they could use those names. For that week, uh, and I did have a slide in there, so maybe I, maybe I can I, I can add that to that. But I'm sure you can find most of this online as well. But I think that's that's a really really good one. Anansi stories. Uh, as stated, Anansi is very visible, very visible in songs, stories, YouTube. Uh, to draw on. Mama Eva has a book. Oh, okay. Mama Eva, right here. Oh, yes, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Louise Bennett um, from Jamaica is a, is, is a phenomenal, or was a phenomenal person uh, who really helped popularize and, and legitimize uh, Patois in Jamaica. Uh, she has a ton of stories and songs about Anansi mm -hmm. and those kind of things um, you can get. I would suggest making some art with some different symbols. Playing on color, which is a very popular game. Uh, in Ghana, I was beaten quite a bit <laughs> by children oh. in Ghana. Um, and we're Ghana's colors during World Cup, just to show a 
support, or playing with those colors, engaging the flag and the colors, I think is a very easy way. And that, that may be it, I think that's it. I stated I didn't want to bombard you with information like I did last year with Ethiopia, but any questions, comments? Yes. So I, I went to Ghana a long time ago okay. when I was an undergrad. And I'm just wondering how much has it changed in terms of the Western westernization? Like I appreciated the dirt roads and right. seeing everyone in the traditional dress and I when I when I visited other countries on the continent I didn't see a whole lot of that. Mm. So what is it like today? What would you say it's like today? Uh, in my opinion, Ghana is still very traditional. But typically, the more you leave the urban sites, the more traditional it gets. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the further north you go, uh, in other words, go, go beyond Kamasi. Kamasi still has a traditional feel, but if you go further north, mm -hmm. it's even you know more traditional, even other ethnic groups. Uh, so in, in those, I think in those localities outside the urban centers, that is still there. However, the, the West influence is, is, is very visible, visible as well. So in, in one unfortunate case in Accra, there was a, a street full of um, a dinker symbols mm -hmm. on, on billboards, on, on walls, but interspersed between the symbols were advertised for bleaching cream, oh. which blew my mind. You know, the, the juxtaposition of yeah. ancient knowledge and wisdom next to this really destructive force. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you, you have all of that. You know, I, I feel like Ghana, Ghana, Ghana has it all. Ghana has the contradictions, it has the tradition, it has the future and the past, all combined in one. One of the most striking things that happened to me, experiences, was I took a group of students from Howard a few years ago, and we met with an historian. And the first thing he said to us was, be careful when you poke. Be, to, be careful when you poke behind the eyes of the dead, because you might find maggots. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. I don't really see us actually literally poking any eyeballs, eyeballs out. But <laughs> metaphorically, what he, what he meant was, when you start investigating the history, mm -hmm. you may get some uncomfortable things. And so we don't discuss a lot of those things. Because if you really bring up some of those things, mm -hmm. who were the slave traders and who were not? Who sided with the British and fought against the British? Who was there first? And who came later? If we, if we actually start having those conversations, you know, if, if we want to have a society that's relatively peaceful and calm, maybe some discussions we probably should not have. Now, for a group of African people from the Americas trying to reconnect to a past, that's not exactly an acceptable answer. Mm -hmm. Because you're going there to find out. Um, so there, but there's this moment where there's a disconnect between you trying to find out mm -hmm. and other folks saying, well, what, we, we haven't had that conversation. We're not really having that conversation. So I don't really know what to tell you. Uh, we're the Funty. We live around Amina Castle. And as far as we know, you all were enslaved. And we don't really know what happened after that. And it's not in our history books. So what are we, this is, this, is the, this is just the dungeon, this is just a physical space. So it's it definitely a disconnect that, that, that's there. Um, but once again, if you, fi if you find it, you, if you want it, you'll find it in Ghana. You'll find black from the West that repatriated back to Ghana, doing very well for themselves in terms of commerce, land, industry. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to be explored in Ghana, yes. Um, you may have mentioned of a date there, um, something about 1945, what was that? 1945 was the 5th Pan-African Congress. Okay, Actually, I had a question about that. Okay. 1945 was also Hiroshima and what was going on in the world at that time. Right. And um, studying with the kids now how the, the world war affected different areas, okay. how did it affect Ghana? That's an excellent question. Uh, the way it impacted Ghana was the way it impacted colonized peoples across the world. 
uh, part of the part of the, the, the vocabulary of the Allied forces mm -hmm. in the Atlantic Charter was but freeing the world. We're fighting this war to free the world. Right. Uh, so everybody joined this war to free the world, including black people and African people. So you have large numbers of, of blacks from the West Indies of Africa who fight in World War II on the side of the United States, the British. But their expectation that, okay, after this war, then we should be free too. Mm. Because that's the, if, if the charter is saying the freedom of the world and the colonized peoples, then that includes us. So we're investing in this war, but we expect a return. That things won't be the same as they were before. Um, so that is a very, that, that definitely informs this Pan African Congress in 1945. And you see these formations in the metropoles of the colonizers. So, in other words, black folks in Paris who were colonized by the French, maybe in Martinique, mm -hmm. uh, maybe in Guadeloupe, Ivory Coast, Senegal, in Paris having these discussions. African is colonized by the British from Jamaica, from Gold Coast, having those discussions in London. And so, Manchester was a major place where Africans were. And actually, it was a, an African named Ross McConnell. He actually was from Guyana, uh, who owned the hotel. And so he used, because he had property, that became the actual space of the Pan-African Congress, which included people like Joma Kenyatta mm -hmm. from Kenya, uh, Siku Ture, uh, out of Guinea, uh, as stated, Kwame Nkrumah, George Padmore from Trinidad, Amy Ashwa Garvey. Uh, they felt that they, were, they could push for African liberation in the aftermath of World War II. So they returned home with that mission to push for independence in the respective localities because this was not the vocabulary at the time. We should be free. But they still had to fight it because obviously it didn't apply really to African people. Uh, but there is, a, there is a definite connect. And that discussion is also being had in Asia as well. India's having that discussion. You know, revolution or, or liberation minded people across the world that were colonized were having that same conversation. Okay, after this, then we shall, therefore, that must include us as well. That's a, that's a great, great question. Which is one reason why Nkrumah says African independence is meaningless if it's not connected to the rest of, of Africa. Mm -hmm. But they also saw themselves as a, as a, as a larger uh, you know, freedom struggle against imperialism globally. So that, that vocabulary didn't just include Africa. Indian Asia was very much in that, in that conversation. So in that same moment, the Bangdong Conference, which takes place in Indonesia, was also a collection of this collaborative Afro-Asian bloc that was formed, but a lot of those networks came out of organizing during World War II and his immediate aftermath. Paul Robinson was a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, W.B. Du Bois was a part of that in that early period. So Robinson is talking about how colonialism in Africa is connected with segregation in Mississippi. They're so making those discussions, the early, making those connections in the early 1950s. Like when Malcolm says, me to Ma Ma in Harlem. Mm -hmm. You know, they're making those the connections were very clear uh, that, you know, the, the language of this Atlantic Charter and the United Nations didn't play out like it was supposed to. I don't know. Yes? Um, people in Ghana today, how do they look at African people from the Americas when they come to visit? How do they view them? Are they like, like you were saying, that there's a disconnect between we've been here, nothing's happened to us, something happened to you, and that's not... Or, I mean, how do they interact with you when you get there? Uh, it, it really depends. Um, I, I've met some Ghanaians that, in my opinion, were some of the most knowledgeable in terms of African liberation, uh, this global struggle, because Nkrumah had a big impact on developing, you know, this ideas of Pan-Africanism. So that's there as well. I mean, you will probably find folks will have different experiences, one, one set experience, and it depends on the spaces you go to. For example, if you're in a tourist market and you're going just to buy products, then people are going to engage you as a tourist in the market going to buy products. And because you're coming from the West, they'll see you as having a certain economic value. But if you stop and talk to people, if you're so interested in who people are, you, you go from being this tourist to a person who's really trying to connect and then things open up. Uh, if you just go eat food in the restaurant, then you'll be seen as someone from the West going to eat food in the restaurant. If you go to somebody's home to eat food, that's a whole different relationship that starts to develop. 
uh, that's more that's more open and more more accepting. There's there's this general acceptance though. There's not I, I didn't you don't want to experience any over like, negativity. Although it's not atypical to find folks from the West complex and understanding being referred to as a European, a white person. Uh, because the whiteness being seen as not just phenotype, but a culture that's outside, a, a westernized culture. Uh, so that happens. That, that, that does happen. Uh, it won't probably happen as openly, but you might hear very young children who might not know when and how you just say it, just by seeing a tourist van. Say that again? Yes, a Bruni. That's, that's the term. That's the term. I was told by the same historian that Bruni, in, in, the linguistically, the word referred to beyond the horizons. Like linguistically, that's what it referred to. Something from beyond the horizons. But in the contemporary context, it can be something of white, or which also mean a culture coming from outside the space. But the relationship that formed with Ghana were very, very bona fide and very, you know, very legit, but it also depends on how you enter the space. But like I said, Ghana is a society that definitely has contradictions. You'll find what you you'll find what you're looking for. But if you're in a tourist setting and you, you just adopt the typical, you know, what was seen as typical, you know, I guess, culture of a tourist, then that's what you'll get in response. But if cameras you go out, from a different... Got cameras and building and... Right. Okay. <laughs> but if you go to, let's say, Makoto Market or, like I said, the market in Kumasi, only Ghanaians go to that market. There's not... So there's a different, there's a different exchange. But if you're in a tourist market that's just for tourists or artists, then, I mean, or, or art just for tourists, then there's going to be that. So the, the key thing I learned was to break down the barrier of I'm not a tourist. I want to see Ghana, but I'm not here just to observe. I'm here as a person of African descent is reconnecting with, with family and, you know, trying to get in tune with the cultural vibrations is very important. For example, in the market, people expect you to bar. Wow. They, they're looking, that's part of the culture to have this type of exchange that's kind of so you do that you know take the tro tro for example you know take 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 the local local mini buses you want to you want to those experiences are really important and I find also interesting is that you don't always know how you're going to respond when you get into a you know like you don't always know what things you're carrying with you until you're in a particular setting. I know for me, when I was in this small little village, uh, this six foot five, 300 pound diesel <laughs> farmer, was like, Keto, Keto, let's go. And he took my hand and we went walking. I said, all right, wait a minute. Because <laughs> where I'm from, you know, man, we, we do not hold hands. <laughs> Thinking not in a public open setting. And I brought that be I'm connected, but I don't <laughs> Can, I, can we have a conversation for it? Let me, yeah, just, 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 just like explain what's really going on. But I had to get over that because there was this, it didn't mean anything besides, you know, we're going for a walk. We're friends. That's, that's a sign of endearment. It wasn't, it wasn't, so I had to get over that. So, okay, I'm not, I'm not here. You know, I'm home and I've been socialized. This, this physical disconnect is not, we're just brothers. Uh, also seeing how women would shake hands and not to shake hands, but you know, all the the things we do and the dipping in the, the shoulder and I was like, wow, this is this is really interesting. This is different than what we So beyond just observing, you kinda wanna jump in. You just don't wanna be the observer. You wanna jump in, you wanna be a part of it, and then there's a different, you know, experience that takes place. You know, you can you can deal with the contradictions better when you kinda just get into the space. But don't go to Ghana expecting as soon as you get out the plane that, you know, Ghanaians are going to run and just start hugging you. Right. Until you return. <laughs> no, when you, when you get off the plane, you're going to see folks probably work all day, just like you might work all day at our jobs, and they're tired, and they see X amount of planes that come, and the immigration officer is not going to be happy, not going to be smiling. Just accept that, get your luggage, deal with the hacklers, we're trying to find a way. Right and enjoy yourself. So, I don't know if that 
answer the question, but I, I, I love God. I love God. Anything else? Mm -hmm. well, we would like to thank Dr. Swan for All your right. presentation. Thank you. Oh, man.